Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. And welcome to this Ophir Photonics webinar. My name is Mark Sletsky. I'm the product manager for power and energy measurement solutions here at Ophir Photonics. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, I always find it fascinating to delve into a topic that until not that long ago didn't really exist. It's always something that's stimulating and makes it makes things uh, let's call it fun, I think is a, a pretty good word to use. And the topic we're gonna be talking about now is just such a, just such a topic. It's, it's quite new. Um, just before we begin on a more logistical note, the total time of today's webinar should be approximately 45 minutes, maybe plus minus. Um, questions, comments are welcome and even encouraged. If you have any questions or comments, please use the text chat box on the right side of your screen. <clears throat> and I'll do my best to respond either in real time or at a suitable point in the flow of the information, depending on the nature and the timing of the questions, comments. Um, I'm mentioning that. I should also mention that uh, you can contact me offline. I'll be leaving my contact information up on the final slide for a little bit after we're done. In case you want to get a hold of us offline. And if I'm already mentioning that, I'll also add that you can get a hold of me, us, through our website, uh, through our representatives or Ophir office in your, your various countries. If you don't know who that is, then you can go onto our website and on the, I believe, the top main menu, right hand most uh, tab there is a contact us page. And then per country, uh, you can see uh, who you, you want to be speaking to and how to get a hold of us to them. And at the bottom of every page of our website, there's a contact us form. Of, I don't remember what we call it, contact us, request solution, whatever it is. We want to make it as easy, as easy as possible for you to get a hold of us. Um, okay, so again, thanks for joining us. Um, so what we're going to be discussing is challenges and solutions in monitoring and measurement for, um, for controlling um, material microprocessing applications. <clears throat> I'm assuming that, that any of you who are joining a webinar on a topic like this are somehow or other involved in laser-based material microprocessing applications either users of lasers or integrators or engineers, technicians, whatever, somehow or other involved. We're not going to be going into any great engineering depth, but I want to try to sort of, I hope I'll have succeeded in finding the right balance between uh, depth and breadth so that everybody who's chosen to attend this webinar will hopefully get useful information out of it. Um, I've tried to keep it as generic as possible. The purpose here isn't, uh, you know, the commercial advertisement for Ophir solutions, although they happen to be good, but that's besides the point. Um, but you'll appreciate that when I bring actual examples of real life solutions, real life devices, obviously I'm gonna be using Ophir devices because those are the ones that uh, I'm able to talk about. Okay, so with all of that stuff out of the way, uh, let's begin. I'm assuming you are somewhat familiar with Ophir. Um, some years back, we were acquired by Newport, and then some years later, Newport, became, Newport together with Ophir, became part of MKS Instruments. Basically, what it said on that slide was that we like to do the hard stuff that you would be happy to get off your head so that you can focus on your work and not lose any sleep over the tools that you're going to need to get your work done. I think that's a fair summary. All right, so what we're going to be talking about today is uh, first we're going to do just a very, very brief getting ourselves all on the same page, kind of, a, of an overview of the need um, you know, behind these kind of micro material processing applications, the need for keeping control of these applications. It's probably trivial and, trivial and obvious, but uh, it's always good to keep our eye on the ball and Keep in mind what, what we're trying to achieve here. And then we'll get into the meat and potatoes or whatever combination you, you prefer. We'll talk about the challenges that are relevant to our discussion, the challenges that are involved in monitoring and measuring ultra short pulse laser beams and 
some solutions that are now out there um, that can be used to keep better control of these of these sort of processes and applications. Um, okay, obviously it's a huge topic. Um, as I said, I hope that I'll have found the right balance between touching on as many points as possible and giving those that I that we touch on the depth that they, they deserve. So that at least you'll you'll have some practical uh, insights coming out of this. Uh, so let's begin with uh, with the beginning with the need. So before we discuss micro material process processing application, let's just first quickly touch on regular material processing and then we'll see how the uniqueness of micro material processing comes into play so basically we're doing something to material okay cutting drilling welding marking whatever it may be so we start with a laser beam of appropriate power wavelength and so on we bring it down to a focus so that we're creating a space within which the power density uh watts per square centimeter uh, the power density is high enough to do the work that we want to do on this material. Um, and here's the space within which the power density is high enough. And somewhere in the middle of that is where we're going to be putting our target material. Uh, the beam might be CW, it might be repetitively pulsed, you know, depending on the application specific nature. So basically it's the power density which translates into heat. Uh, in essence, that makes the process happen, that burns, melts, vaporizes, or whatever it is, the material inside the space within which the power density is high enough. The quality of the result we get uh, is going to depend on how well we control the shape and location of that space. So you can think of this as a sort of a brute force kind of an application. Um, uh, now we come to micro material processing applications. Uh, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to actually turn off the video so that I don't distract you or myself. Um, you know, I, I like looking at myself sometimes. Um, so here we're talking about applications that need a more delicate touch, either because we're working on more delicate materials or we're trying to create more delicate, smaller, higher resolution features on the materials or both. Uh, you, know, you can think of the difference between a carpenter building a house and a carpenter crafting fine furniture. All right, so examples of that might include you know, some fine detailed marking and engraving, uh, cutting the cover glass for smartphones, so you can appreciate why the material is delicate, the work is delicate, and it must be quite precise. Drilling via holes in printed circuit boards, separating flexible OLED displays from the glass substrate that they're manufactured on, a process also known as lift-off. Okay, so there are some challenges, and I imagine that any of you that are working in these sort of applications have already, you know, crashed into some of these challenges. One of the main ones is that the heat spreads outside the space within which we're trying to do the work. And when it spreads outside that space, it might no longer be intense enough to do the work, but it's still doing something. So the area that's affected by the heat uh, is called the heat affected zone. Okay, that's a you know sensible, a sensible name for, for that concept. Um, so inside that space within which the power density is high enough, <clears throat> and as we saw in the diagram before, there I'm vaporizing or cutting the material. The power density is high enough that the heat density is high enough to vaporize, cut, drill, weld, zap the material. Uh, outside that space, I might no longer be vaporizing the material, but I'm certainly affecting it due to the heat. Think of, uh, of eye surgery as an illustrative example. I wanna process the material at the target location, but outside that target location, I don't wanna affect the material at all. And that's an important idea. Um, and in the case of continuous beams or let's call them long pulse beams, the heat has time to move outside the target space 
during the course of that process and affect, even if not process, but still affect the surrounding material. Let's call it partially process the surrounding material. And as one side consequence of that, that also means that my process is not quite efficient because not all of the heat is contributing to the process. Some of it is getting wasted by moving out of the way. So the solution that has been coming into, into use in recent years is to use ultra short pulse beams, USP beams. Uh, ultra short pulse means picoseconds down to even femtoseconds. You notice I put nanoseconds here, but in brackets because nanoseconds are kind of borderline. They're not quite ultra short. Uh, until recently, nanosecond pulses from Q-switch lasers, that was, you know, the, the ultimate short pulse. But in the last couple of years, that's already become kind of, oh, nanoseconds. So nanoseconds is sort of borderline. I put it down here just for completion, for completeness rather, but uh, in brackets. Um, the idea here, or one of the main ideas, is to keep the heat affected zone as small as possible. The short pulse duration means that the heat during the pulse has no time to dissipate to the surrounding material. Um, the target material is locally exposed to a high enough instantaneous power density that it gets zapped before the heat has a chance to dilute itself, if you will, as opposed to a longer pulse where the instantaneous power density will be lower, not low, but lower, and it would take more time for the material to get zapped. And during that time, the heat will move somewhat through the material, leading to a less well-defined affected area, and also more energy per pulse is therefore needed to get the same work done. In other words, a one microjoule pulse, for example, in a femtosecond pulse laser will do much more work than the same one microjoule pulse in a microsecond pulse laser. And the result will be cleaner. So just to get a basic understanding of the mechanism, um, power, remember, is energy per time. Power is a rate of flow of energy. So. Okay, I mean, I said we weren't going to be going into any great engineering depth. I hope uh, this one little equation, you know, doesn't uh, throw anybody anybody off. Uh, but as you can appreciate that, as the pulse duration or the pulse width, as we usually call it, becomes shorter, the instantaneous power gets much bigger. And by keeping the absorption to a very tight space and time, very tight space by focusing it and very tight, if that's the right word, time by using ultra short pulses, the process happens within a very small space and within a very small time. And uh, increasing our throughput becomes, I don't want to call it easy, but easy. Basically, we increase the pulse repetition rate. And uh, in typical use in such applications, we find pulse repetition rates somewhere on the order of hundreds of, of kilohertz uh, up into the megahertz. And we're dealing with average powers that are typically tens to a couple of hundred watts. Um, okay. There's another mechanism. And that's called multi-photon absorption. So until now, we looked at a thermal mechanism. Um, so there's another mechanism which has nothing to do with thermal effects at all, and that's multi-photon absorption. <clears throat> um, let's explain it this way. In normal conditions, normal things happen, usually. A photon is either absorbed and imparts its energy to the material, or it, do it doesn't get absorbed. It passes through the material because the material is transparent at that wavelength. In general, that means a, a, a material is transparent to a given wavelength, when the energy of the photon at that wavelength is smaller than the available energy levels in the material. And if you're not familiar with the physics of this, don't worry about it, but uh, hope you get the basic idea. Um, so a given kind of atom has certain available energy levels and photons that come in having that energy can get absorbed because there's an appropriate place for it to go. There's an appropriate energy level 
um, that's able to absorb that photon. If there isn't an appropriate energy level, even if there's a bigger one, but it's not the right one, the photon will not get absorbed. Um, if I remember correctly, Einstein got his Nobel Prize for figuring out the details of how that works. Um, and the photon slips through in ultra short pulses, like picoseconds and, and shorter, uh, where the instantaneous electromagnetic field is very high, the likelihood of non-ordinary <clears throat> effects increases significantly. Non-ordinary effects can be, for example, the absorption of two or three photons together as a single event. While the material might be transparent to a single photon at that wavelength, uh, as you probably remember, the energy of a photon is directly proportional to its frequency or inversely proportional to its wavelength. So longer wavelength means less energy photons. Um, uh, so while the material might be transparent to a single photon at that given wavelength, <clears throat> two, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, two or three photons together have more energy and can find an available energy level to get absorbed, you know, to get absorbed. So the two or three photons combine and get absorbed together. This means two things. First, the material that would otherwise have been transparent at that wavelength becomes absorbing. Not at that wavelength, but at the so-called new wavelength. Uh, and that's the second effect. The two or three photon absorption has the same effect as reducing the wavelength, increasing the energy as if it were one more energetic photon or lengthening the wavelength, the wavelength in effect by a factor of two or three or whatever, uh, increasing the photon energy by a factor of two or three, which gives the photons the ability to break the atomic structure of the target material. This is similar to how ultraviolet radiation is harmful to our skin. It doesn't give us sunburns uh, by heating the skin. It gives us sunburns by actually affecting the molecular structure of certain materials in our skin. So no, keep in mind, we're not talking here about thermal effects, but it's a different mechanism. Um, the way we use this to advantage <clears throat> is that this enables new processes and not only allows us to improve existing processes. An interesting uh, uh, application that I came across uh, a little while ago, certain types of marking of syringes uh, using ultra short pulses, which change the refractive index of the glass locally in a very tightly defined spot uh, to give the visual appearance of printed symbols. Regular, quote unquote, short pulses, even nanosecond pulses will create micro cracks and micro bubbles in the glass, but will not do the delicate work of changing the refractive index without affecting the surrounding glass. You know, those sculptures that you sometimes see with images patterned inside the glass, those are done using such short but not ultra short pulses. The patterns that you see inside the glass are micro bubbles and micro cracks caused by heating. Exactly what we don't want in micro material processing applications. All this, as you can appreciate, is going to create some special requirements from the absorber that we're going to use in the measurement sensor. Um, and we're going to come to that momentarily. All right, so here, uh, just a few examples of such processes. In this case, all produced using various spectrophysics uh, ultra short pulse lasers. Here you see some surface structuring of polymers scribing on a silicon solar cell marking on peak polymer used for medical devices just to give an idea of what can be done using ultra short pulse uh, laser beams okay let's talk about the why and the how of monitoring and measuring and controlling the process i gave you a hint of where we're going to be going so think about regular material processing laser application. Um, again, we have that beam, we focus it down. Here we create a space within which the power density is high enough to do the work. Okay, what happens though, if the power changes, if the focus shifts due to let's say heating effects on the focusing optics, 
um, or if uh, you know process debris starts uh, settling on the focusing lens and changes its behavior, um, the power might shift due to aging of components in the drive electronics or in the optics, uh, the optics delivery, uh, you know, the delivery train. Um, we could suddenly find our target material outside the space within which the power density is high enough to do the work. Um, basically, parameters that are not controlled can unexpectedly change what the process is doing and where it's doing it. And that can make your process unpredictable. In the case of a, an industrial commercial process, which is what we're discussing today, uh, that can eat into the profits that it's supposed to be generating. All right, so I trust I don't need to belabor that point too much. The parameters that affect the quality of the outcome of a micro material process um, are basically wavelength, average power, stability of the average power, and pulse duration. Average power, I call it average power and not just power because I want to differentiate between that and the instantaneous power during the course of a pulse. So I try to use the precise terminology so that we can uh, avoid any confusion. Uh, so just briefly touch on these wavelengths. Okay, the wavelength of the laser is going to define the amount of energy that gets absorbed, transmitted, and reflected by various materials. <clears throat> uh, additionally, the minimum spot size that we can achieve, the smallest focal spot that we can achieve, basic physical optics is proportional to the wavelength. Um, since many materials exhibit, exhibit a high absorption in the UV, uh, UV lasers are very popular in these sort of uh, micro material processing applications. Uh, average power, okay, that's kind of obvious. Uh, average power translates directly into process throughput. So for example, if you know drilling one via hole in a given PCB requires a certain amount of energy, then a laser with a certain amount of power can drill so and so many holes per second, right? A power divided by the energy per pulse you know, that's how many pulses per second, how many holes per second uh, we're, you know, we're going to be able to achieve. So obviously, the higher the power, the more of those individual doses of energy we're creating, the more features we can create per unit time. The laser power stability, this should also be obvious. The power stability is going to determine the variability of the process around its desired values. Uh, this can manifest, for example, as differences in via hole diameter and depth, and it's therefore going to limit the density of vias that we can create. Pulse duration, okay, that has a critical effect on microprocessing. We touched on that. We're going to touch on that a lot more now. Uh, as the laser pulses become shorter, the instantaneous power during each pulse becomes increasingly larger. In today's discussion, we're going to be focusing primarily on power and power stability measurement. Uh, measuring wavelength, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's pretty easy to understand how that needs to be done. And for measuring pulse duration, generally one will use, I don't fear we have a line of, of solutions like this, um, you know, high speed, uh, you know, fast photo detectors with output to an oscilloscope or, or some kind of an instrument like that. Uh, but again, we, we're not going to focus on those. We're going to be focusing in our discussion now mainly on, uh, you know, monitoring the power and the stability of the power, which kind of come together. So now let's talk a little bit about the challenges in measuring these kind of ultra short pulse beams, and then we'll look at the solutions. So now we're getting more into the, into the, what did I call it? Meat and potatoes, fish and salad, you know, whatever. All right, so obvious you know, way of damaging uh, sensor, um, this is, you know, the first challenge that needs to be dealt with in any kind of a measurement instrument is overloading, All right, But that's kind of trivial and almost obvious. Uh, more relevant to our discussion and a little more interesting uh, is not too much power or too much energy, but rather too much power density or too much energy density. I hope the resolution of the WebEx tool we're using is enough for you to be able to see this. But here you can see the absorber surface of a standard thermal type broadband laser power sensor. And I hope you can see that there is a burn mark that takes up a good part of the aperture of the sensor. 
Um, by the way, I should just mention, not all such burn marks are necessarily damaged. Sometimes it's weak enough if it doesn't affect the absorption by more, at least at the wavelength of interest, by more than, let's say, a percent or something like that, then it could be considered considered cosmetic. If it doesn't affect your work, then, you know, then maybe you can, you know, ignore it. Um, but here, the fact that we can see it, well, and I hope in the image you can see it, in real life you can easily see it, and that is a pretty clear indicator that the absorption obviously has been affected. Um, I should mention, too much power density, uh, it's you know, you'd be surprised at how often even seasoned professionals miss this point. You are doing the work in your application in the focal plane. You don't want to measure the power in the focal plane. Because if we measure in or near the focal plane, <coughs> we run the risk of material processing our sensor. And you can see a beautiful example of that here. A really, really nice you know, symbol marked on the absorber of the sensor. That's going to be a pretty expensive replacement of the disk, the, like the main component of the sensor. You know, it's unfortunate. So, so first we're talking about the first mechanism and the ones we just looked at. Here we're talking about damage that's based on thermal effects. And I'm stressing that because in a second we're going to see non-thermal effects. But first let's just understand the thermal effects. Again, not getting into the physics, but just <clears throat> understanding what happens. So too, many, too much power density or too much energy density, um, it's going to cause too much heat density in the absorber material, the material of the sensor that meets the incoming laser beam, um, and that runs the risk of damaging it. Um, there, so there's too much power density. There can also be too much energy density. Now, uh, both of those get specified in sensor data sheets as what's generally in our industry called damage threshold. Now, these are two different kinds of damage threshold. The maximum number of, let's say, kilowatts per square centimeter that a given type of sensor can handle, and a maximum number of joules per square centimeter or equivalent. Now, it's very important to understand is that, or to just be aware of, is that the maximum energy density is not one number. It actually depends on the pulse width. For shorter pulses, the, that damage threshold comes down. Short pulses can much more easily cause damage than longer pulses. And the reason for that is because with short pulses, as we saw, the instantaneous power during the pulse, or the peak power, as it's sometimes called, is higher, which means that it can more readily cause damage. It's the, in a sense, it's really the instantaneous power density more than the energy density itself that does the processing, the unwanted processing on the sensor material. Um, at Ophir, at least, we normally specify that damage threshold not in terms of maximum instantaneous power. We specify it as maximum energy density, but we give it at a few different typical uh, pulse widths. Um, and the reason we do it that way is uh, simply that it's much easier for a user, usually, to know these two numbers, the energy density and the pulse width of the laser, than it is to know the instantaneous power during the pulse. So just to make it easier for a user to be careful, we specify it like this. But you can appreciate that conceptually, what we're really saying is that it's the maximum instantaneous power density that really is the, the risk factor here. Now, notice that you know, we give it at maximum energy density for 10 milliseconds, two milliseconds, okay, you know, typical pulse durations for the sort of applications that use each type of sensor. Notice that we stop at less than 100 nanoseconds. There we give the most, uh, you know, the shortest, da the lowest damage threshold, and we stop there. We don't mention, you know, one nanosecond or whatever it is. Um, the idea is that once the pulse is so short, I remind you that we're still talking about thermal effects, and in a second you'll understand why I said that. 
The idea is that once the pulse is so short that the resulting heat has no time to move out of the way during the pulse, from a thermal damage point of view, it no longer makes any difference if the pulse is even shorter because the heat has no time to move out of the way during the pulse. So we're at maximum risk factor and therefore the lowest number as the damage threshold. Now, all that applies to thermal damage effects. <laughs> Once there's no time for the heat to move out of the way at all, <laughs> we're at the maximum risk of thermal damage. But for ultra short pulses, there are also non thermal effects that can also cause damage. Um, and here we're talking about things like ablation, which is an almost instant uh, damage effect. Uh, short pulse lasers in the picosecond, femtosecond range may have relatively low power and energy density. Uh, average power density and energy density, but can still damage general purpose sensors due to the extremely high instantaneous power. And here you can appreciate why I'm being so pedantic about differentiating between average power and instantaneous power. This is especially true for UV lasers where the photon energy is high and the photons can break molecular bonds more easily. So there's yet another damage mechanism that's uh, you know, looming in the background. So we have a few, you know, many ways of damaging a measurement instrument. Too much energy density, okay? too much average power density, to both two kinds of damage threshold, and then combinations of the above. In many of the sort of applications we're talking about, you might have, let's say, you know, microjoule pulse energies, which is not a high energy, ultra short pulse widths, <laughs> which already tells you that we're dealing with high instantaneous power, megahertz pulse repetition rates, which means we're, even though the energy per pulse is small, the average power ends up being relatively high because of the very high pulse repetition rate. So these sort of combinations of, of these parameters uh, will bring down the overall bottom line damage threshold. And that's because we have more than one damage mechanism happening at the same time. So when we run into that sort of a situation, that's when we need newer, more innovative solutions. So let's look at solutions. So first of all, on a more basic level, it's important to understand two main kinds of <laughs> absorber that are used normally in sensors. <laughs> we call these surface absorbers and volume absorbers. Okay, so a surface absorber is your typical, you know, matte surface, black or dark gray absorber material that's opaque. And it's opaque, so all the light gets absorbed by a very thin layer of surface material. Now let's imagine a pulse having energy density of you know, one joule per square centimeter. And let's say it's a very short pulse, you know, Q-switch laser, nanoseconds. So by the time the end of that pulse is getting absorbed, the heat that was generated from the absorption of the beginning of the pulse has had no time to move out of the way. So all of the heat generated by absorbing one joule per square centimeter all of that heat is sitting in a very thin surface layer of material. Typically, we're talking about a layer a, a couple of atoms thick, and that material had better be able to handle it. If we're talking about a longer pulse, by the way, which is not what we see in the drawing in the diagram here, that you know a millisecond pulse or 10 microseconds, um, then by the time the end of the pulse arrives, some of the heat that was generated from the beginning of the pulse will have, yes, had enough time to move at least a little bit out of the way. So the heat is a little bit less concentrated simply because time has enabled it to spread a little bit. But for short pulses, that's not the case. And this is why, you know, less than 100 nanoseconds was the shortest that we gave for thermal effect based damage threshold. Um, so what's often done for short pulses is we use a different kind of absorber that's not opaque, it's partially opaque. A good, a typical example might be a neutral density absorptive glass filter, an attenuating filter. Uh, 
And that what happens there is that the light gets absorbed incrementally as it moves through the thickness of the material. Um, a nice illustration. Think of, you know, as you go deeper in the water, you know, less and less light makes it down. I was just looking for an excuse to include this photograph in, in the presentation. This is one of our sons and I uh, about 12 meters down scuba diving off the coast of Eilat, southern tip of Israel. I love that picture. I just thought it was <laughs> incredibly cool. Okay, I have, an, I have found an excuse to use that. Um, and what happens here is that regardless of how short the pulse is, it's easier for the material to handle it because the optical nature of the material is what's spreading out the heat uh, because of that incremental partial absorption as the light moves through. So those kind of absorbers are much better at handling very short pulses with high energy density because the heat gets spread out optically. There's ups and downs. The, these absorbers cannot handle very high average power or very high average power density. There's always trade-offs. It's not by accident that the word trade-off is one of the first words you learn in any kind of engineering curriculum. Um, all right, so that's the more generic kind of solution. But for ultra short pulses, we, you know, the, the industry has been developing innovative more you know more sophisticated solutions and basically we're talking about specially developed materials specially optimized absorbers for use in beams that are that make use of ultra short pulses and these make use of you know particular material properties um you know typically we're talking about the the energy band gaps that are available in the in the atomic and molecular structure of the material we won't get into the physics of that and whatever um the optimum choice of which one you're going to use because there's now a few of them becoming available it's going to depend on whether it's high energy low energy pulse frequency what wavelength what part of the spectrum you're in the word trade-off doesn't go away just because we have more advanced solutions just the trade-offs now move into a slightly you know different place on the graph so here you see one example of a no fear sensor that was re developed just in the last couple of months specifically for ultra short uh ultra short pulse uh, laser beam measurements um here are just a, you know a few examples of uh, from ophir's lineup uh, some of these you know, Point isn't to remember this chart. These are just the, you know, the, the names that we use for the different you know, absorber types. Um, some of these are based on traditional volume absorbers that we just, described, that we just explained. Um, note that the traditional volume absorbers are typically for pulse repetition rates up to, say, a couple of kilohertz. These guys, this is, this is our basic workhorse broadband absorber. This is already a volume absorber. So again, you don't have to remember the numbers up by heart, obviously, but you, can, you know, the, I'm just pointing out that the traditional volume absorbers are a good solution up to a point. They can handle high energy densities, even for extremely short pulses. But as soon as the repetition rates start getting up above more than a couple of kilohertz, the average power and the average power density start to go up. Then we start needing the more innovative kind of, uh, of absorber materials. Um, so some, particularly uh, at the high pulse repetition rates, are based on these new innovative absorber materials. I should mention the new absorber that we call CM. This is, this is the one that we just saw the sensor in, in, a in the image a second ago. Uh, CM, I have no clue what that stands for. Um, so this one, actually, I should point out, sits right on the, the sweet spot of uh, many of today's micro material processing applications uh, the one we call s and notice that that goes up to very high pulse rates um, up to moderate energies up to just getting into the millijoule range for higher energies and higher repetition rates that's where almost nothing can handle it up to a certain point there are very advanced solutions that can still handle it the one we call SV is really at the top of the line. It's actually a very, very unique uh, absorber. Uh, SV is an acronym for, this one I do remember, it's an acronym for surface volume, meaning it really combines the best of both worlds, you know, high frequency and high energy, up to a point, obviously. But that point is, I think, unparalleled in the industry. Um, 
again, the point isn't to remember this chart, obviously. The main point that, uh, that I want to give over here is that with ultra short pulse lasers, you will want to consider a bit more in depth before choosing. And since this is a relatively new field, it would be a good idea to discuss the best choice for your ultra short pulse application with the measurement instrument manufacturer to be sure that you're getting a tool that's going to continue to operate and operate accurately for many years, even under the harsh demands of ultra short pulse beams. Um, Okay, just one, for the sake of completeness, it's worth pointing out <clears throat> that in addition to the regular laboratory type sensor on a optical mounting base and handheld instrument or whatever, or direct to PC interface, um, there are now some all-in-one instruments, some pretty interesting ones, um, often including a diffuser that spreads the beam out so that the, it reduces the energy density or, and the power density by the time the beam actually reaches the absorber. Here you're looking at a completely self-contained device. Uh, this one actually sits, on the, sits, sits comfortably in the palm of your hand, um, self-contained, so it can be put into a process chamber. It's got a you know, display. It can also communicate with a... With a you know, instrument using Bluetooth, uh, onboard, you know, logging of measurement data, you know, some, some really interesting capabilities there. And these sort of all-in-one instruments in many of these applications make life a lot easier uh, in a lot of these industrial scenarios where you might not be in a standard optical lab with an optical table and a handheld instrument. So I'm just mentioning that for the sake of completeness, because in many cases that might actually be the, the configuration of solution that might you know, so that might solve your problem. Okay, so in summary, whoa, I had said around 45 minutes. We're at 41 minutes. Oh, okay, not bad. Um, time management and I don't always go that well together, so I'm, I'm pretty pleased that, that we're on target. So in summary, okay, we briefly touched on the need for ultra-short pulses, what kind of things they can do that regular you know, that so-called regular, more traditional beams cannot do, or at least cannot do as well, but very often cannot do at all. Uh, the need for monitoring any kind of a process, as I said, that's presumably well understood by anybody participating in a webinar on a topic like this, but has to be mentioned. Um, talked about the why and the how in general terms of monitoring the process to keep it under control, to keep it stable. Um, and, you know, you know, signal preventive maintenance if any parameter starts to drift before it causes us loss. And then we talked about some of the main challenges that we have to deal with when we're trying to measure these ultra-short pulse beams, thermal effects, but also the non-thermal effects, and some traditional and more innovative solutions that are now becoming available for, uh, for controlling these beams. And my recommendation that um, when choosing a solution, check not only the classical traditional issues like damage threshold and all that, but also specifically discuss with the manufacturer um, the behavior of the solution, the suitability for the solution for dealing with ultra short pulse uh, beams. Okay, that's uh, what I wanted to, to discuss. My name again is Mark Slutsky. I'm the product manager for power and energy measurement solutions here at Ophir Photonics. I hope this was helpful and dare I say, maybe even interesting. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a really nice rest of the day.